We do hope that you enjoy hearing this special audiobook presentation and that it will help to light your pathway in life. Please feel free to share this audiobook with friends and loved ones. This is for educational purposes only. Message from Pleiades The Contact Notes of Edward Billy Mia Volume 1 My First Observation At the age of five I had my first conscious UFO experience. This was the observation of a great disc-like flying object. It was on the 2nd of June 1942, at exactly 9 o'clock in the morning, at Biulak, in Canton Zurich. Together with my father, I was standing behind our house beside a great nut tree, and looking eastward in the sky, like being attracted but only vaguely knowing why. I felt an until now unknown desire in me which compelled me to look high above the eastern horizon for something. That seemed very mysterious to me then. So I just felt the strange desire, and I looked for anything in the azure blueness of the sky on this rather warm and beautiful summer morning. Ten or fifteen minutes may have passed before my eyes fastened onto something peculiar. From out of the light sky, with quick velocity, a silver flash shot down hurled like a gigantic metallic arrow, over Ischimoserberg, right toward the 75 meters tall Reformed Church steeple. But just short of that great tower the silver flash cut to the right and shot past it directly toward our house, and with enormous speed swooped up again. In that small part of a second, the swift flash became gigantically large and round, to a great flat metal disc. It was like a huge disc as 250 to 300 meters in diameter. The disc sped along at only 200 meters height above us, completely silent. Like a flash, as it had appeared only a second before in the east, it now disappeared to the west over the Hierogen forest. For a long time I stared westward after the disappearing object, and then I realized that my perplexed father was also staring headshakingly into the west. I asked him about the fast flying disc, and he observed reflectively that, this must be the newest secret weapon of Hitler. At five years of age that answer was quite insufficient for me. The ponderous American bombers often flew over our village, dropping bombs while, as often happened, German Stukas and other fighter craft could be seen across the border. In my estimation they were as primitive as the American bombers some of which had been shot down directly over our village by the Swiss Air Force, or otherwise captured. This did not seem to agree with my father's explanation. He, being a straightforward, dependable, old-fashioned man, harbored no great thoughts about technical developments. But I, as a five-year-old boy, was very interested in such marvels produced by the wild and evil war cries around the world. I followed by radio, the continuous bomb attacks of the Americans and the rolling thunder of the heavy tank and artillery guns which carried to our village over many kilometers day and night. It was just not logical to me that all the primitive and murderous weapons of this Second World War could have anything in common with the futuristic disc I had seen. These and other reflections about two very different worlds rushed together in my consciousness as I pondered this below the nut tree. There had to be another explanation than my father had, not only because of my thoughts, but also because the disc suddenly seemed to me rather familiar. I could not get over the thought that I had already seen the same or very similar discs elsewhere, and under more peaceful circumstances. My thoughts and presentiments led me to watch the sky day and night, especially at night when I could see traveling stars high in the sky, some bigger and some smaller. Satellites were then still unknown, and I already recognized the bombers and fighters sufficiently by their continuous appearance. On the other hand these more primitive aircraft were not able to fly so high, like these driven and often flashing stars, which moreover often executed zigzag flights, like I had never seen any airplane make. Just as I saw those traveling stars then, one can see them today, very high in the sky at 20 to 40 kilometers height, at night in a clear sky. To be sure you are not watching satellites, the best time to observe is between 2200 and 200 because at this time the Earth fully shadows the sky from the sunlight behind it, 
and it cannot reflect from passing satellites above. Even, in sane cases, certain scientists try to affirm the contrary. As the UFOs perform their controlled flights high in the sky, they are usually seen no bigger than stars. My first observations were alone at night when I observed them as traveling stars, but this changed in a rather short time. One nice and warm late summer day I saw, to my delight, a spherical object high in the sky, slowly approaching and descending until I could see that it was a regular sphere. Then it disappeared in a flash with no trace and without any noise or reason. Following that time these daylight operations were repeated, and one day I again felt something strange in me. It was like a voice somewhere in my head, and also inexplicable pictures presented themselves. High in a voice and pictures advised me intently and continuously to search for answers and also to find them. This began in the late autumn of 1942 only a few months before my sixth birthday. These strange thoughts, the inner voice, and the pictures began to worry me, because in my ignorance of such things the thought came to me that I might be going crazy. This was the reason I turned to one of our Protestant ministers in the hope that he could help me. And he did very readily, and with evident knowledge about this matter, although I had never told him anything before. It seemed to me that he was very well informed on this UFO matter and had considerable knowledge in this respect. So he advised me about UFOs and my inner voice and the pictures, and explained that I should try as quickly as possible, by myself, to answer the voices calling inside me. I can still remember his kindly taking away my fears with the words. You need not worry, as you know that what you hear and see inside of you is only telepathy. For my astonished look he then explained to me in much detail what I should know about telepathy. Besides this, he explained for me many other facts which I at that age did not understand too well, but in later years learned to understand completely when I also came to knew of this old worthy aflove clergyman being an initiate. I did as the priest advised, and tried intently to direct my thoughts to the often heard voice and to address it. One day, a short while later, I suddenly felt my thoughts making contact somewhere, somehow. The first reaction from the other side was like a gentle light laughter, which I heard deep inside of me, pleasant and relaxing which calmed and delighted me. Then the contact faded away once more, and I neither heard the voice nor saw the pictures. Suddenly all was quiet again. Note. Students of this phenomena and real contactees will immediately recognize these symptoms of validity and be able to relate to what is developing here with Edouard Mia. To them his experiences have meaning and confirm the nature of what is happening to him. But before that, while I continued my observations, in November of 1942, I had a rather peculiar experience. It happened in the land Genzigan in an out of the way meadow behind the Aragon forest which was used for glider landings. One day, from a cloudy sky, a pear-shaped flying object descended and touched the ground. Out of the object came a very old man, and he signaled for me to come to him. I followed him without a word to say, and allowed him to take me into his evicle. Almost immediately, I noticed on the screens that we were high above the ground, then the pearly ship descended again and settled gently onto the ground without my even feeling the touchdown. The old man motioned for me to walk out, which I did, like walking in a dream. As soon as I was out the object rose straight up and disappeared into the sky at a splitting speed as I stared in astonishment. Deep in thought, I headed home, deliberating whether I should tell anybody about my experience. Then I decided to keep silent and not even tell the priest. So I lived with my secret and became all the more reserved. During my simple object observations over the next two years, another far-reaching experience frightened me. Even though explained by the priest, I had no idea of the different forms of telepathy, and became frightened when on my birthday, on 3rd of February 1944, a new voice suddenly rose in my consciousness and ordered me to now carefully learn and collect knowledge, to be transmitted to me in this way. I feared I may be losing my sanity again, 
and so I was afraid. I did not dare to entrust this new situation to my parents because I did not think they would be able to understand me. On the other hand I did not trust this inner voice, which this time was very clear in my consciousness, because I was of the opinion that this could be some form of delusion, though I always tried to calm myself. In fear, I again confided this new situation to the priest who listened very patiently and attentively. I told him everything in the smallest detail. Gently then, this wise man smiled and said that I had no need to worry, because he was informed about these things. But, regretfully, he could only do so much, and teach me thoroughly certain matters. In this respect it would be necessary that I keep absolute silence, as these things did not agree with his profession as a minister. He would continue his mission, to work as a priest, and for certain reasons at this location to try to make clear to human beings, slowly, the truths of their religion. This was a heavy undertaking, as the humans in my home village were very strong believers in God, and with this, superstitious too. I did not understand then, exactly what he was talking about, and also did not grasp the deeper meaning. It was only many years later, when I had already forgotten the priest, that I clearly came to understand that the voice in my consciousness had nothing to do with insanity or delusion, but was only another kind of telepathy, and was the thought voice of another human being who lived on another world. The priest explained that the voice sounding in my consciousness was a telepathic communication method like the other telepathy event of two years before. This form of telepathy could be exercised over unlimited distances and without impediment, except for spiritual blockade. For the first time I heard the expression, telepathy, when he called this form of communication by that name. It could also be exercised from human to human over their normal consciousness as well. Two years before, when he spoke of telepathy, he spoke of spiritual telepathy, yet not the overriding of one's primary thoughts, transmitted through material consciousness. In the second conversation he first explained to me that I was exceptionally receptive to extremely high frequencies, and that creatures of lower levels, such as earth humans for example, would not be able to force entry into me spiritually. This would be only exclusively possible for higher developed creatures, because I had came into this life to carry out a special mission, and so had to be protected from wicked machinations and influences of lesser developed intelligences and beings. The explanations of the priest seemed very good, though he gave me a blow when he explained that my life would be very difficult and full of private suffering, which has been true up to today. With his explanations I overcame my fear and troubled myself to enlarge the telepathic contacts, which until now had been one-sided. I put questions and received answers too, which confirmed what the priest had said. These telepathic contacts turned out to be communications with a human being who called himself Sfad. I was initiated into what appeared to be gigantic events, which often seemed to me rather mad. The consequence of this was that it all but isolated me from my environment. I allowed intrigues to take place against me without defense, as I had also done before. By this I became the scapegoat for all evil deeds which happened in the village. But I did not care about this, and only silently smiled inside myself when such untruths were offered against me, and I suffered for those. I was often treated to such blows that afterwards I could neither stand nor sit. In this way my whole position became more toughened, as well as at school, which I began to miss. But this did not disturb me because I nevertheless learned much in school to become later and in better time still more thoroughly and deeply educated by the telepathic contacts with Sfad. Through my many unexcused absences the masterpiece in the worst year amounted to 173 unexcused absences, peculiarly, nothing happened from the school administration. On the contrary, they left matters as they were, until I had completed all the school levels until only six months remained and then the school administration struck back. But these events, which were only a tiny jot of my life, anticipated the consequent course of my history, in which I shall not go into detail here. 
It was then in 1944 when Svab began telepathic contact with me, and I, turned by the priest's explanations, responded positively to this contact. Still I did not knew then that the first contact of two years ago sprang from the same source, and that the old man who had taken me with him in the pear-shaped craft was the same Svav, himself, who now informed me telepathically about being prepared for a very difficult and most important mission. I now had to decide for myself whether I would want to undertake the burden of this personal mission or not. From his explanations, I had been selected for this before my birth, and was, according to this, under steady control by this person. That it was really true, I would be able to prove from the fact that at an age of six months I had fallen ill from a very severe case of pneumonia, and hope for my survival had been given up. Late in the night, Dr. Strubble, a medical doctor, had prepared my parents for the shock, that on that same night I would finish my life. As I lay in a coma, at the point of leaving my earthly life, he, Svav, had intervened and brought me back to life. Of course I wanted to examine this statement of Svav's, and so I asked my mother about events of my babyhood. To my astonishment, she confirmed Svav's words and explained that a miracle happened, as there really was no hope for my young life. Even Dr. Strubble called it a miracle which was plainly unexplainable for him, because according to his medical tests the night before, I should have been dead in the morning. Sfad explained to me many other matters, taught me, and gave me data and information about which I must remain silent my whole life. So the time passed until late summer 1944, when once again, as I strolled alone, deep in thought, through the Langenzingen of the Hierogen forest near Biulak, I had walked some distance along, when suddenly Svav announced himself by his new becoming familiar telepathic method, and explained to me that I should wait some minutes and not get worried. So I just waited expectantly to see what would happen. It did not take long, only a few minutes, and there a silvery object flew from the sky. As a for my understanding, seeming rather strange formation of metal not more than five or six meters in diameter. Near to me the object touched the ground, a pearl-like flying machine, as I stared in fascination. I could now see something moving in the side of the object, an opening forming itself, and out stepped a figure. It was an already very old man, who was inside of a very strange suit. He was now walking towards me like before, when years ago I saw him for the first time. This time he was in a sort of deep-sea diving suit, which was quite silvery outside, and of which the helmet was missing. Yet through this suit his whole appearance seemed venerable and wise, and I still remembered very well how he seemed to me like a venerable old patriarch. A bit awkwardly, the old man came up to me and spoke up in my mother's language and the flat dialect used in our village. But evidently he was a bit unacquainted with it, because he pronounced some syllables incorrectly, which struck me at once. He explained that he was Svav, and that I should come with him now. Under an easy sort of coercion I followed him, as I had done a few years before, to the peculiar pearl-like object, and that I was some new elevated through the door without recognizing how I was lifted. Suddenly the door closed itself behind us, then Svav led me through another door into the inner part of the object, to a small room in which there were three peculiar chairs. The walls and strange desks were full of instruments and controls. I also saw some different small windows in which figures moved, and in some I saw the whole landscape around outside the flight machine. Then Svav ordered me to sit down, and he worked with some apparatus there. I did not understand. In the different small illuminated windows, I saw that the figures and the pictures of the landscape were changing and I suddenly realized that I was seeing a bird's eye view. Inquiringly, I now turned my eyes to Svav, who turned to me and sat down. He explained, those little windows are not windows, but viewing screens, which at present and also in the future will be developed on Earth. It treated of a picture transmission by certain energies. 
Then he explained to me that now we were very high above the ground, at about 70 kilometers height. Here we would stay for some few hours, as he would have to tell me many very important facts and educate me on some very important matters. He explained to me my reason for being already developed to the age of a 35-year-old due to his efforts and that my spiritual development was about equal. I had passed and left behind earth standards. And because of this nobody would be able to answer some of my spiritually directed questions. Which really happened as neither the priest nor my then teacher Karl Graf were able to answer some of my questions. It is interesting for me today to recall. Having then felt no fear when Svav told me that we floated 70,000 meters above earth. I did not even wonder about this as everything appeared rather familiar to me, and self-explanatory. In fact I no longer wondered about those explanations of Svav, and I kept stoic calmness when he told me that he would further care for me only until the beginning of the fifties, and would hand this mission over to another, as his time was nearing its end. Svav explained that mankind of Earth would approach a very dangerous time, and the still-running Second World War would see its end in the following year of 1945, because the time would come when the event of Sodom and Gomorrah would be repeated in all its malignance, and from which the end of the war would be initiated. Today it is evident that the dark prophecy pertained to Hiroshima and Nagasaki which received the first atomic bombs of our age. Sfad also made other statements about which I am obliged to keep silent the rest of my life. Sfad never told me his age, yet I estimated him to be 90 to 95 years old. He never told me his origin, and what my mission would eventually become. The first I knew of the last matter came decades later, Fran another source. But much would happen before then and I would meet with many things which often forced me to the edge of delusion, and also to the edge of death. However I was always able to bridge the dangerous situation with my own forces, and only in a few cases was I given help, about which I now knew for short today, and that this was always directly or indirectly by extraterrestrial intervention. On the whole I was put pretty much on myself, and all actions and doings I had to master by myself. From that I learned very much and finally was able to profit by each situation. The stay with Sfad lasted a bit more than four hours, during which he transmitted great knowledge to me. At the end of the meeting he ordered me to lean back in my chair, after which he then placed a formation of innumerable wires and tiny instruments around my head. Wondering about that and what might follow now, I looked calmly at him and how he manipulated the buttons and switches and suddenly I realized great things inside of me. All was suddenly inside of me a great knowledge, recognitions of many kinds of old and new things. I felt quite suddenly peculiar forces penetrating into me, like suddenly I knew events and occurrences of the future. I wanted to cure human beings of sickness and many other things. Then all at once these influences stopped and Sfad removed the strange instruments from my head with the explanation that now I would have the abilities which were awakened in me by the instrument, which abilities had been developed inside myself at an earlier time. I would not lose these abilities now, but I would never be allowed to use these abilities egotistically, or for profit, or just for demonstration. The knowledge and talents awakened inside me were only allowed to serve now for my own development for the mission which I was to carry out. If I were to offend this order, then an implanted fuse would automatically block all, and it would remain and be active until the danger had passed. This, he also explained, would also block scientific tests and possible powerful influences from outside, should it be tried to force entry into my knowledge and abilities so entrusted, such as attempts by hypnosis, in which case the blockade would come into effect. The block was so strong that under certain circumstances it could react to menace the lives of those trying to force penetration of these secrets. This has sometimes happened in the course of New York life, I could state. Note. This remarkable instrument and its use by Sfad reminds us of a similar inculcation device used on Bill Herman by his extraterrestrial abductors from Reticulum. See UFO contact from Reticulum.
by Stevens and William J. Herman, same publisher. In the Charleston case the device was used to inculcate vast amounts of knowledge into Bill Herman's mind which was all previously unknown to him, and it included ancient past history as well as future events as described by Edward Meir here. Much of the knowledge was inculcated in such a way that a given event happening would trigger the release of a quantity of knowledge not previously in the conscious mind of Bill Herman. After these last explanations, Svav brought me back to Earth again, to exactly the same place where we had started from hours before. Then he once more disappeared into his pear-shaped ship and I never saw him again. Only I still noticed his voice for four years after, when he transmitted many facts and much knowledge to me. On the 3rd of February in the year of XXXX, his voice dismissed me as he sounded old and tired, and then he faded away forever. Only a few hours after Svad's fading voice, which had in the meantime become like a part of me, a new voice came into me just as with Svad. It simply was suddenly there and spoke to me. I felt this voice as being young and fresh, full of force and quite different from that of Svad, very soft and harmonic. This new voice told me it was a she, and could be called Askit, and she now would be my new company. So she became the second contact and through her in the course of the following years, I acquired a phenomenal knowledge and phenomenal understandings. Through her and her abilities I was led out the first time towards the far world, which I later would journey for a very long time, and there were so few short years for me to examine and explore so many things, and above all, to learn from this. Note. Upon establishing telepathic contact with me air, Ask it took over his education where Svath had left off and guided him through a series of adventures designed to toughen him for adversity. It was she who led him through Africa and the French Foreign Legion, the desert caravans, the slavers and the bootleggers, into the hands of the pirates of the Arabian Sea, and across the Indian Ocean with smugglers to the subcontinent of India where he made his living as a snake catcher, mendicant and aesthetic. In India he made his way to an ashram north of Delhi, where he studied and meditated under a teacher. And there Askit contacted him many times and he saw and photographed her ships on a number of occasions, sometimes in front of hundreds and even thousands of witnesses. But that is another story, quite extensive also, and very illuminating, but far too much to go into detail on in this report. In fact the Dalsmere well known to the Pladians and Askit knew Semjes personally and even carried out research projects with her.